Okay, so we should be recording. Um, hello, thanks everyone for joining us this morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you're dialing in from. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join us. This is the MCS um, admissions webinar for spring 2018. 2019, oops, 2019 admissions. <laughs> um, uh, we have to, what we're going to do today is we have a slide deck that we're going to share with you to just go over some basic information with the admissions process. But first, I'm going to go ahead and have John and Vivica introduce themselves. I'll introduce myself and then we will go ahead and get started. Um, at the end of the slide deck, we'll open it up for questions. Um, so just post your question in the Q&A. We'll get to it from there versus the, the chat window please. Um, John and Vivica, please go ahead and in introduce yourselves. Great. Hi, my name is John Hart. I'm the uh, Director of Online and Professional Programs in Computer Science. I'm also a professor uh, there in Computer Science, and I run the MCS program. Hello, everyone. My name is Vivica Kutuligam, and, and I'm the Coordinator for Computer Science Graduate Programs. Hi, everyone. My name is Christine Martinez. I'm an academic advisor with the D Computer Science Department, working specifically with online MCS. Um, with that said, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my desktop with you so you can see the slide deck. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes. Yes? Okay, perfect. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Let's see. Did it advance? There we go. So, John, do you want to go ahead and take this, this slide for us? Sure, sure, absolutely. So, um, welcome. Uh, we're glad you've uh, looked to us for the Master of Computer Science. Uh, we offer a Master of Computer Science degree. It's also known as the MCSDS. It's a Master of Computer Science in Data Sciences. And that's because when we launched the degree, um, it uh, had coursework that focused on the data sciences. And we still have coursework that focuses on the data sciences, but we're also offering a bunch of new courses that uh, include computer science outside of data science. Uh, we've got some new courses in parallel programming, in programming languages, in software engineering, and in scientific computing. So the, there's a, a broader selection of, uh, of courses available for you. Many students choose to put MCSDS or Master of Computer Science and Data Sciences on their resume or in LinkedIn, and that helps uh, signal your future employer or other people looking at your credentials that you've got experience in data sciences from the University of Illinois, in addition to the Master of Computer Science. So uh, what are we looking for in admits for the MCS program? Um, it's a multidisciplinary program. We are getting students with a bachelor's degree in computer science and in computing, but also a bunch of students and applicants uh, with a bachelor's degree in other areas. So we're looking for a bachelor's degree, but that bachelor's degree doesn't need to be in computing. You can have a bachelor's degree in uh, physics or chemistry or any of the sciences or in engineering, but we also get students with bachelor's degrees in um, humanities, uh, in history, and uh, uh, other areas or um, uh, students even in the fine arts. We have students that um, have advanced degrees in medicine or law that want to get a computer science degree as well. And so we see students treating this MCS degree in the same way that you would treat an MBA as a way of adding a master's degree in business or in computing on top of a disciplinary degree. Uh, and that's worked uh, historically for the MBA, and, and a lot of students will add an MBA on top of their disciplinary uh, bachelor's degree uh, to show competence in business and proficiency in, in business administration. Uh, we have the MCS as a, uh, as a way of adding that on top of your bachelor's degree if you want to show a specific proficiency in, in the computer sciences and specifically the data sciences. So you do not need to have a bachelor's degree in computing. You can have a bachelor's degree in any other field as well. But we do require a bachelor's degree. Um, in addition to that, um, uh, the, your GPA should be 3.2 or higher. We use holistic uh, admission criteria so that we look at your entire admission packet um, and we consider everything. But uh, we do follow a general guideline of a GPA grade point average of 3.2 or higher, usually a B plus average or, or better. Um, in order to maintain good academic standing in our program and the students in, in this MCS program meet the same academic uh, standing criteria as all of the other students in our graduate programs, um, you, you're required to have a, a GPA that's at the B plus level or higher. Um, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the norm for graduate work. Um, 
So um, that GPA, if your total GPA is lower than that, we look at the last two years uh, of your GPA and specifically your GPA in your computing courses. Um, so just send us everything and we'll take a look at that. And uh, um, our, our primary goal is that we want to make sure any student we admit to this program has everything they need to succeed in this program. We do not want to admit any students into this program that are going to struggle um, uh, with any of the coursework. Uh, so we're very careful to make sure that, um, that we've communicated to all of our applicants um, what's needed in order to succeed in the program. And finally, the third thing that we need is proficiency in, in computing, enough to get through our graduate level coursework. Uh, the University of Illinois Computer Science Program is ranked fifth in the nation. It's uh, very highly ranked, very rigorous. Um, it has, uh, you know, the University of Illinois is well known for computing. Uh, we invented online computing here um, for uh, education with the Plato system back in the 70s. Uh, the NCSA, the National Center for Supercomputing uh, is here. This is where the browser was invented. We have the, you know, the fastest, most powerful supercomputer on any college campus uh, with our blue water system. We had some of the first computers uh, uh, built uh, on this campus. But the, uh, um, we have that long history of computer science, but also some high expectations of, of students. And we want to make sure that students have uh, the background needed to get through our, our graduate level coursework. So specifically, we need um, uh, courses, coursework or, or commensurate uh, 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 proficiency in, uh, in computing, um, in linear algebra, uh, in probability and statistics, and within computing, uh, specifically the courses of data structures, algorithms, and object-oriented programming. And many students already have a course, you know, an, an introduction to computer programming course, and those usually cover object-oriented programming and some algorithms, uh, but we also need that second course in, uh, called data structures. So if you want to look at our course catalog, the courses in our undergraduate that we expect all of our graduate students to at least have, uh, have been through as prerequisites for our graduate level coursework, those courses are CS125, CS173, and CS225. And specifically look at CS225, uh, that third course in the sequence, that's our data structures course, and it covers a lot of material um, on uh, algorithms and ways of organizing data uh, to be able to be processed efficiently and to be able to do much higher level things like data mining and uh, machine learning uh, using those uh, principles of, of programming and, and abstractions of data into those data structures. So um, uh, we also have a new course that we'll be rolling out called CS400. It's an accelerated computer science fundamentals course. And so uh, if you don't have that data structures course, we can um, uh, we can show you how you can enroll in that CS400 accelerated CS fundamentals. That course doesn't count towards the master's degree, but that course can allow you to get the background computing necessary to, um, uh, to be able to enroll in our graduate level uh, uh, courses for this degree. And, uh, and then the degree consists of eight uh, graduate level computer science courses. Um, at the 400 level and higher um, uh, based on, uh, um, on those admissions criteria. Okay, next slide. There we go. Um, Vivica, you want to talk about some of the applications <laughs> yes, requirements? Thank you. So um, this slide um, gives a quick overview of the application requirements. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, I've got water. Okay. Um, so if you frame? are, uh, no, let me just, I'm going to just jump over here. Thank you. It's very informal. Um, if you are a domestic student, um, domestic applicant that is citizen or permanent president, the application fee is um, $70. And for all other students, the application fee would be um, $90 for that application. This is all online. And if you go to our the direct link to that will take you to the application portal. Um, what's required is so there are three letters of recommendation that you can submit. Um, John, do you want to go over the letters? Or? Sure. Um, let me just say about the letters of recommendation. Uh, we use the same application form for our Master of Science and PhD applications as well as for the MCS. 
Um, the, the Master of Computer Science is a professional degree. It's, it's based on coursework. If you want to get a Master's of Science or a PhD, you can. The admissions criteria is a bit more difficult because in addition to taking the coursework that you would take for the MCS degree, you also have to make an original contribution to the state of the art in computer science through, the, through a master's thesis or a PhD dissertation, and it requires a lot of additional work um, in, in order to do that. And so um, uh, we have letters of recommendation that address those uh, aspects of those degrees. For the MCS, the letters of recommendation are optional. Uh, we're primarily looking for your ability to succeed in advanced computer science coursework. So if your letters of recommendation can speak to that, specifically if you're missing, say, the data structures or, one of, or linear algebra or probability and statistics, one of those prerequisites. Um, if you have a letter of recommendation from a former employer or manager or, um, or a former instructor or somebody that can speak specifically to those abilities you may have that don't that aren't reflected on your transcript then you can use those in your letters of recommendation but otherwise if you don't have three letters of recommendation they're not required you don't need to include those we'll primarily be looking at your transcript um, uh, that has uh, the course coursework that you've taken and any other materials that uh, you'll be providing uh, in order for us to gauge your ability to succeed in these classes. Uh, thank you, John. Yeah. So the next piece uh, in the application is a statement of purpose, which can be um, fairly concise and brief for this program of study. Um, we get questions about is there a particular type of formatting that is needed? There is none. You can um, upload a simple PDF or a Word file. Typically we see things that are less or maybe up to a page, but it can be very concise and precise and brief. Um, the CV or, your, or the resume, now this is an important piece of information that you would upload because it, in addition to the information you provide on the application itself, um, there are other pieces of information that we can get from your resume. For example, um, if your work history gives us some information to, for ex to determine, for example, if, you, if your educational experiences have been outside the US to, to assess if you are eligible for a waiver or not. So what we would like to see on your resumes is when you um, list your employment history, please make sure that you tell us where you were um, located, where your employment was based in, for example, if you were with Microsoft, tell us whether you were in, in the US or in India or in another offshore location. The transcripts, perhaps the most important piece of information you would upload to the application. At the time of application, we only want your unofficial um, transcripts. So what does an unofficial transcript mean? You may have a copy of your official transcript. So scan those scan those of cop a copy of the official transcripts and there are certain pieces of information that we will need to see. One, we, we need to see the institution. The name of the institution should be legible. We need to see the classes that you have taken and that includes if there are course numbers, the course titles, the grades that you have earned. So these could be letter grades, it could be a one to hundred scale numeric scores, whatever the um, course outcome was. And we also need to see what the, the grading scale that your institution used. For example, at U of I, we grade from an A plus to an F. Um, some institutions may have um, grades that are just plain numeric. And if you go to a school that has a letter grade, then there is a GPA scale. For example, again here at U of I, it is a, four, a 4.0 is an A or an A plus, a B is a three, a 3.0 GPA. So we want you to scan both the grades and the courses as well as the letter grade. In some transcripts, this is found on the back of your transcript page. In other transcripts, this might be at the very end of the document. The last page can sometimes be a um, grade scale. So make sure that you upload a upload one page of your grade scale. Um, if, um, if you cannot see the scanned copy, 
then we will not be able to see it either. So after you scan it, we do want you to make sure that it is legible and that the document is complete. For example, we've seen sometimes instead of all four years of education, somebody might give us just the last two years or maybe a couple of pages. And that is not sufficient. We need the full transcript. Um, just a quick note, in certain countries, for example, in India, these transcripts are just basically your mark sheets. And we can take those mark sheets um, as long as we have all that information. Once you upload the unofficial transcript, we will use that for making admissions decisions. And when you're, if you are admitted, then the University of Illinois, the graduate college, requires you to submit official transcripts. If you're in the US, it's uh, generally a pretty easy um, deposit. You can just order an official transcript to be sent. The, the graduate college does require official transcripts. So if you have an official transcript and you send a copy of it, that is not going to be accepted. You may have to order a new transcript, even if it is from an outside the US institution. We will work with the admitted students to give you directions. The graduate college also sends, sends information, but this is just something to keep in mind. Christine, do you want anything else to add? No, that was great. You covered it. All right. And then um, we get questions about standardized tests. The GRE or GMAT, the exams are not required. If you have taken them and if you have scores, you can just attach a copy, a PDF copy of the score report to your application. It's not required. Now, if you are an international student, and I'm going to in a minute define what an international student would be, you would need to provide TOEFL scores or IELTS scores. And those, the requirements are posted on the slide. And for those who might be calling in, let me just say that the total um, TOEFL score re required would be 103. And if you're taking IELTS, it's a total score of 6.5 or higher for admissions to the graduate college. Um, and they both have to be less than two years old. And this is, this is a general, um, general policy that scores are valid for two years only. Do we have the exceptions on the next page, Christine? No, we don't have exception, okay, exceptions so for... There are, yeah, there are some exceptions to the requirement of TOEFL or IELTS scores for international students. Let me give you an example. Um, I went to school, let's say 15 years ago, in a country that is not considered eligible to receive a waiver from TOEFL or IELTS scores. So I'm an international student, but I've been working in the US for the past, let's say, five years. So if I have been working in the US or any of the eligible countries for the past two years, you can request a waiver from these TOEFL scores or IELTS scores, but there is a requirement that the department has that you would need to have that information sent to us directly by your employers. This information is on our website. When you go into the applications processes, the requirements, you can look up the details about how to submit this request. In the application itself, you do not have to do anything different, but if you are admitted, then it is at that point that we will look at what your um, employment history is if you were an international student. I think that covers this slide. I think it does. So uh, the tuition for the uh, MCS uh, degree, including the MCSDS check is 600 per credit hour. That's a total of uh, about $19,200. Uh, intuition for the complete 32 hour degree. The degree is eight classes, um, and each of those classes is four credit hours. Um, let me say also that in addition to tuition, you would need to pay uh, for MOOC access. We have private MOOCs of, uh, on the Coursera platform for each of our courses, and that costs right now about $160, $158 to access per class. Um, then there's also proctored examinations in addition to what's available on those MOOCs. Um, there's also um, comprehensive examinations that are proctored and, and as a student you pay for those proctoring fees. And that's typically about $40 or so per course for all the proctoring. 
Um, and then you may need some uh, computing services like Amazon Web Services in order to do some of the assignments, and that varies from class to class. And so that's a kind of a course fee on the order. All of those fees are on the order of what you would pay for a book in any of our on-campus classes, um, and uh, much of that information is available on the MOOC. So uh, the total amount of the degree, and this, this is not per year or per semester, this is the entire degree, is about $22,000. Uh, and the advantage of paying per credit hour is it gives you flexibility. Um, if there's a semester and something comes up that semester, you're getting married or, or you know, you need to spend some time with your family or something comes up at work and you need to take that semester off. If you're an on-campus student, you would have to pay some tuition amount for that semester you took off. But as an online student in this MCS program, we charge per credit hour. So if there's a semester where you're not taking any, any uh, classes, you don't pay anything. Um, and that's just factored into the design of the program, one of the things that we can offer our online students. If you do need that semester off, we do ask that you contact Christine and that you let us know uh, that you won't be taking any classes that uh, semester because we do want to keep track of how all of our students are progressing through the degree to make sure that uh, students haven't hit a stumbling point in, in their progress towards the degree. So keep in touch with us, but if you're not taking classes, you're not paying for that. Uh, for financial aid, um, our, uh, the MCS degree, it, uh, over the Coursera platform, our ability to offer it to a wider variety of students than we ever were before, is fully accredited uh, by the HLC, the same accrediting agency that accredits all of the programs at the University of Illinois. Uh, it's the Higher Learning Commission. When you get the MCS degree, it doesn't say online, it doesn't say data sciences or any, any of these, or Coursera or anything else. It says Master of Computer Science uh, at the University of Illinois. You're getting the same degree that our on-campus students are getting that many students before have gotten uh, from our department uh, here at the University of Illinois. Uh, so that means you're as eligible for financial aid as any other student on this campus. Um, if, uh, if you want to explore financial aid options, we'll point you towards the um, office, uh, our OSFA office for financial aid um, at that link that is displayed on the screen right now. Um, I will mention that um, the Department of Computer Science does not have any assistantships or other funding available for graduate students in the uh, online MCS program. Um, so that's not an option available for you, but those other options for financial aid are available for you um, if you would like to explore those. Uh, do you want to talk about sponsored sponsor third, part, third party billing? Yes. So if so, for those students um, who are supported by their employers, for example, we have a large number of students who, who are working full time, and they may have programs at their respective employers where the tuition would be covered, where the employer would pay for the tuition rather than a reimbursement program. So if you are in that type of situation, there is a, there is a, there is a structure, a mechanism in place where you're, you can sign up to have your employer directly to be billed so that the billing and the payment is all taken care of outside of your, um, your area of um, being part of this program. If you are interested in getting some more information about that, please check this uh, link on the um, website on the page it's https um, paymybill.uillinois.edu your employer does need to do a little bit of work in terms of getting registered for to be a um, third party pay but that is an option available okay and let me also mention that uh, one of the common questions we get is how do you pay for the courses you pay for them as you go so if you take one class in a semester then you would need to pay the tuition for that class in that semester at the beginning of that semester okay i think that covers that slide and we'll go on to our final slide um, with just important links, um, the application can be found at the first link and it's also found on the program website. Um, you can, oops, what happened here? Sorry, okay. <laughs> you can uh, actually check the status of your application once you've submitted it um, 
when you go to the same link that you've submitted the application to. I believe this link is an old one, Vivica, correct, that we should remove. So please disregard that. Right? Yeah, disregard that particular link, but you can check the status of your application when you log back into that previous link. Um, financial aid link is available there and the program website there as well. So that concludes the slide deck. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing here. Okay. Um, and then we'll just go ahead and open it up for Q&A. We have quite a few questions coming in. Um, let's see. So we'll just get started on those. I, um, I did, uh, go ahead. One question that keeps that's popping up, and that is if your GPA isn't uh, is below that 3.2, um, uh, and we will look at uh, your your GPA in your computing classes specifically. Um, the other thing to do is that if if it's been a while since you you had your degree, you can take a few more recent classes, especially computing classes at a community college or other online sources or. Um, um, other options that you might have available and you can send us those grades and we'll, we, can, we will consider those grades as well. And so there's options of improving your GPA with more recent coursework um, if your GPA is below that 3.2 uh, uh, baseline. Okay, and another thing that keeps popping up and I guess we can just address quickly is this is an online program. Um, so we're covering um, online MCS. So this is not for the on campus program. And since it's 100% online, um, you can apply to it and participate from anywhere in the globe as long as you have internet connection. So that answers that question. <laughs> I participate from Champaign, Illinois. And so That's right. Um, it, it is online. It, it offers more flexibility. All of your um, all of your materials and assignments are available from day one, so you can work arbitrarily fast ahead into the classes as you would like. You still have to take exams at a certain time, and you can't fall behind because many of our assignments are being DA graded, and there's class interaction. So you have to keep up with the class, but you have the opportunity to move faster ahead, especially if you see some kind of um, um, something coming up with work or at home that you're going to need to spend a, a couple of weeks with, uh, you can you can do those assignments ahead of time in order to have that flexible uh, time uh, available for you. The other thing is uh, another question we get is how much time is required for each class. Uh, each class is uh, four credit hours, um, and typically uh, a credit hour involves three hours a week of work. So a four credit class would be a four credit hour class would involve about 12 hours a week of work and that's an average so you're going to be studying and cramming and, and uh, working up against uh, assignment deadlines so there's going to be weeks that will involve, involve less work and weeks that will involve more work but you should budget about 12 hours of your week towards a class so typically students you know won't take more than two or three classes three classes is a full-time job at the mm -hmm. Okay, so looking at some of these questions, um, one that is frequently popping up is about uh, taking the MOOC only portions in advance and how does that play into their degree work once they're admitted, if you could address that, John. So, um, uh, the MOOCs um, are available on the Coursera platform. What's available are, um, are just MOOCs. Uh, which are kind of the videos of the lessons, the lectures that you would get from half of a course. When we offer a course for credit, we use the MOOCs to represent the, uh, the lecture portion of the class and some, you know, class time exercises, quizzes, and, and some small assignments and so on. That experience is similar to sitting in on one of our campus classes. You could show up for campus and just sit in and listen to one of our campus classes. Uh, and, and benefit from that lecture, but you wouldn't get any credit towards the class uh, because you wouldn't be registered. Um, the university can only confer uh, credit to admitted students, admitted and enrolled students of the University of Illinois. Um, we do not give course credit for just taking a MOOC on the Coursera platform. Um, we use those MOOCs just to, uh, for the, for the uh, lecture portion as video lessons. 
um, and some of the assignments uh, for the class. But in addition to that, when you are a registered student for a four credit class, in addition to the video lessons and assignments from two MOOCs that would be offered on the Coursera platform, there's also comprehensive examinations, there's, uh, there's class projects, significant machine problem programming projects, and in order to get those, you're going to need help from TAs and the instructor in the form of office hours and interaction. You get access to Piazza, which are the same news groups um, that our on-campus students use so that students can talk to each other. And when we can, we actually mix the two um, uh, groups of students so that uh, on-campus on students and the online students can talk about assignments together since we're, we're teaching much the same thing at the same level. Okay, great. Thanks, John. Um, so here's... All right, sorry. I, I got distracted. Uh, one, one other thing is if you, if you take a MOOC, so for example, we have cloud computing concepts. And there are two MOOCs uh, on cloud computing concepts that uh, uh, Indian Gupta teaches uh, for that course. If you do all the quizzes and any of the assignments there, if those quizzes and assignments are used for the four credit portion, what you did as a MOOC student will transfer in. So you can uh, you can take those MOOCs to see if you can get through the material and, and understand the material enough to be able to get through the class, and any work you do for that will transfer in. It won't be sufficient to get course credit, though, and you'll still need to do the assignments, um, you know, the major assignments, the programming projects, the comprehensive exams, and so on. But you won't need to redo any assignments you did as a new student. Okay, perfect. Um, so here's a question um, with respect to coursework. Uh, the program seems light on deep learning coursework. What plans are in the works to keep up with the state of the art in CS in regards to deep learning slash AI? Okay. Actually, it's, it's not. Uh, what we don't have, we don't have a course called Deep Learning. Uh, <laughs> we do have a lot of deep learning in the curriculum. Uh, we have applied machine learning, and there's uh, uh, deep learning is a significant component of that applied machine learning class. The nice thing about applied machine learning is you're not just learning uh, you know, the optimization and the graphical models and, and some of the abstract details of machine learning. You're actually you're, you're, you're understanding how to take those and apply them to real world data, things like motion sensor data and, and so on. And, and one, of the, um, one of the tools you have in your toolbox for that is deep, deep learning, convolutional neural networks and, and other um, recent approaches, uh, recent advances in machine learning. On top of that, we've got a new course that just came online this fall called um, Practical Statistical Learning. And uh, practical statistical learning comes from our stats department, uh, and it's a, it's a machine learning course, but an advanced 500-level graduate student-only class on, on machine learning. And also, we plan on having a capstone in machine learning available, uh, perhaps as soon as this spring. But you wouldn't be able to take that capstone until you've taken the applied machine learning class and the practical statistical learning class, and also you have to take the applied machine learning class before you can take the practical statistical learning class. Okay, um, let's see. And all, and all of those uh, incorporate deep learning. In addition to that, data mining is the application of machine learning to databases, and there are deep learning concepts in that, um, uh, and, and it, it pops up in, in a few other contexts as well. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, here's an interesting one. What would be the most efficient way to close the knowledge gaps in a way that's acceptable to the U of I admissions team? Uh, John mentioned the fundamentals course, but I didn't catch if that was contingent on admission. I have a non-CS undergrad, but work in analytics data mining, self-taught Python. Good, good, yep. So yeah, um, no, you can get in the CS400 without being admitted to the program. And in fact, we can look at your, uh, at your performance in CS400 to determine um, if you can be admitted to the program. You can also apply to the program and if you're, if you're successful with everything except for, for example, that data structures, we can look at your application package and see if we can use the results of CS400 as the missing component to admit you to the program. So we send your admission and we will consider that option and we'll offer, to you, offer it to you if it's appropriate and available. Okay, um, let's see. 
Um, there's a lot of questions about TOEFL. Vivica, do you want to do a quick rundown one more time of um, who would need to submit TOEFL? So let's maybe put that slide back up too as I um, go on to okay. the, the criteria. So the easiest way to think of this is if all your education is, all of your education is in one of the eligible countries, and that would include the US, Canada, Australia, um, England, UK, and certain countries in, on the African continent, and you can go to the graduate college to find out if your country is exempted from TOEFL or IELTS requirements. If you have, if your last degree is from one of those countries, then you would not need to submit TOEFL or IELTS. Let's say if you, if you are an international student applying from overseas and if your country has does not have a waiver, then you have to submit TOEFL and IELTS. So these are two ends of the, um, the range. One, we know if you have always completed your education in a country where the first language is not English. So let me do a little bit more details on that. You, you may have followed all your education in the English language. Your bachelor's, maybe you have another master's, they're all in English. But if the first language in the country is not English, then you will not be um, receiving a waiver. So it's, it's all based on the first language, the primary language spoken in the country. If you may have um, graduated from an institution in a country like that where you would not have received a waiver, but let's say following that degree, you have been working in a country for two plus years. So two years would be the requirement. And if you had worked in a country where the, the primary language spoken is English, then you can request a waiver. Can so, I share this? Yeah. Uh, so let's uh, put the link on the chat space. Uh, yep, I did put the link in the chat. So okay. there is a chat a link in the chat space, and you can go and you can search for your specific country's requirements for admission there, and whether or not TOEFL would be required for you based on your um, country educational, educational um, qualification. Mm -hmm. So it is not based on country of citizenship. It is not based on your lo current location. It is based on your educational history. That's what we want to be clear. And this is where we get a lot of questions. I am, so I am a US citizen, for example, that we would see students, or I'm a permanent resident, and I'm actually using myself as an example. I do not, though, if I were to apply for this program, I would not qualify based on my educational experiences. I would qualify based on my employment history because I do not have a degree from a country. I do not have a degree from a country that is exempted in the past five years. That's, uh, that is the other part. So if you have a degree earned, let's say in the US, if, we, if that degree was awarded more than five years ago, then that exemption is no longer valid. But let's say you had a degree earned in the US 10 years ago and you've been working in the US since then, then you can request a waiver. Does that cover about all the examples that we have? I think, I, I think it does. If you have specific questions about whether or not you qualify for a waiver based on employment or academic history, please send us an email to mcs at cs.illinois.edu and we will address your specific question there. Sound good? Yeah, and then um, on the slide, it showed the scores and also in the link that uh, Professor Hart uh, put, or John, uh, Christine put on the chat space, um, you can also see what scores are needed. Again, it's for uh, um, TOEFL, it is a total of 103, and for IELTS, it's a total of 6.5. Okay. I see one um, of the questions is uh, some of the courses we mentioned don't appear on Coursera. And in fact, uh, we're in the process of uh, giving some of the courses that have ju just been recently available to our MCS students. They're not yet available to the general public as MOOCs yet. So that's one of the other advantages of the MCS uh, uh, program is you get early access to things that uh, people don't have access to yet on Coursera. 
Okay. Here's a question about um, course logistics, John. The classes, um, I, okay, I'll rephrase it as a question. Are the classes recorded or do we need to be online at specific times? Uh, that's a good question. So the classes are pre-recorded. In fact, they're, um, what you'll be watching is not a video recording of a classroom. What you're watching is an instructor uh, teaching his class or her class specifically to you uh, as an online student. Uh, so um, what, what we have is, uh, is uh, lesson video, the same as you would see in any other uh, Coursera MOOC. Um, and, and it's not uh, some uh, recording of a classroom that's happening at the time. So those video lessons are carefully edited. They last, each lesson lasts five to 15 minutes and there's a bunch of them. It's a very efficient way to learn. We found that an hour's worth of lecture video um, can usually be handled by 10 minutes of a video lesson that's been specifically produced for online students. So uh, you, can, um, you can watch these, uh, say during your morning commute, uh, or you can binge watch the entire week uh, in a Saturday, in a weekend, uh, if you've got time, depending on what your schedule permits. Um, so it's, it's a very uh, um, uh, asynchronous way of learning that uh, that's designed to better meet with your schedule. Uh, with that said, there are some things that, uh, for example, office hours. Uh, instructors and TAs will be available for office hours. Those are synchronous, and we handle those through the Zoom system, just like we're using now as, uh, as, as essentially a video chat session with a TA um, or with the, uh, with the instructor. Um, we try to have those at various times uh, throughout the day so that they work with multiple different time zones, um, but those are available for you, but those are synchronous. Okay. Uh, they're, they're not required either, but they are helpful if you need the help. Okay, um, here's another question. Are professors in the course material for the online degree the same as the one on campus? Is the degree going to be the same as the one on campus? So yes, uh, same professors, same instructors uh, online as we use on campus. We've got Indy Gupta, we've got Zhao Wei Han. Zhao Wei Han teaches data mining. Um, he not only teaches data mining, he wrote the book on data mining that everybody else at other universities is using. So. Uh, if you have a friend that's getting their degree in computer science and tells you about this great data mining book, you can say, oh yeah, I took the course from the guy that wrote that book. Um, uh, we've got other instructors, um, uh, Indy Gupta, uh, Roy Campbell, um, uh, all, all of the professors that are teaching these classes on campus are also teaching them on the platform. And very often, uh, they're teaching them at the same time. So while the class is online, we also have the class going on campus, and you have a chance to interact with the on-campus students if you have any questions. Often our on-campus students benefit from the online students because the online students can help the on-campus students if they have any questions. Okay, oh, here, this is a good one. What general statements can you make about students that seem to be most successful or struggle with the degree? I think that's the first time we've gotten that question. Yeah, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, you know, I've talked, uh, you know, I've taught classes now since the 80s, um, late 80s, early 90s. The, the biggest issue we run into with any class is procrastination. Uh, and I am just as guilty of procrastination as any of the students are. Um, if you can, if you can get out ahead of an assignment, you will do so much better with that assignment than if you wait to the last minute to finish the assignment. So um, get an early start. The, the other thing I tell students is that in addition, you're going to finish the assignment, you're going to get a grade, it's going to appear on a transcript, but then you go, go, you're going to use your degree uh, to get a job or to launch a startup or to um, you know, interact with others in, in some fashion um, that they're gonna be, need to be aware of your expertise. In addition to having the class, you can, you can come out of the class with a portfolio. Every time you do a class project, there's an opportunity not only to fulfill the requirements for that class project, but to also come out of that class with a class project of something that you can use to impress your friends, to impress your future employer, to impress your, your parents, uh, anybody you want, uh, you'll have things that you can show them and you'll be working on things that, that are at the forefront of computer science, um, things that are tangible. Um, uh, you'll have visualizations, you'll have, um, you'll be working with Yelp data in data mining, you'll be working with, with real world 
um, data that, um, that will have applications beyond just the class he used it for. Okay, um, here's another good one. Um, I've heard some of the courses haven't worked out all the kinks yet of being totally off online. It sounds like some assignments instructions are vague and you're forced to rely on forums and busy work to get through. Can you speak a bit about what the typical student experience is like and how you're working through it? Sure, sure. So we've been offering this degree online since the 90s. So every one of our courses is, uh, is suitable for online. And we, we don't really have issues with offering our courses online. We worked out those issues long ago. One of the things that we are um, evolving towards, though, is asynchronous online. Our, our past courses have been offered synchronously, meaning you're in lockstep with the course that's going on on campus. We had courses where the videos were just videos of the lecture and, and you, you felt like uh, you're seeing the, the professor from some perspective inside of the classroom. Um, the, uh, the assignments were weekly. You would have to show up synchronously at the time of class to watch that lecture. I think now the videos are available later, but they're still on a weekly schedule of when those lectures are available. Um, so what we have now, what this MCS program offers you uh, on the Coursera platform is lesson videos in this MOOC style asynchronous format. So all the videos are available for the entire semester. All of the uh, assignments are available for the entire semester at day one. Um, what we're struggling with in some, when we first launch a course, is often we're, try, we're still trying to perfect some of those assignments um, and some of the other uh, aspects of the course, and they won't be ready from day one. So uh, when some courses were launched, we still had a few uh, details that we hadn't worked out yet. And so not all assignments, not all videos were available from day one. And, um, and students who have taken MOOC class, you know, taken ordinary MOOCs on Coursera, weren't used to that environment. Uh, with that said, um, those issues that, that the questioner asked about, uh, you know, uh, rubrics for, for uh, assignments not being very detailed and uh, coming out at the last minute and so on, what you're getting there is actually the on-campus experience of graduate education in computer science. Um, there are many classes we offer at the graduate level where, um, you know, the students are at the advanced stage of computer science and we will just off the top of our head assign something and then the students will have to work through all of these issues. We try to minimize that for a, uh, a professional master's degree like that. But what you're seeing is a glimpse of some of the most advanced coursework you have and how it's rough around the edges because it's so advanced. Um, I'm going to take one more minute and tell a story. There's this mathematician, I can't remember the details, but there's a, um, a math graduate class where uh, somebody is a mathematician that won the Fields Medal in math, and I'm trying to remember which one it was. Uh, he was a grad student and he showed up late for class and he looked at the board and he saw some problems on the board. So he worked out the problems and then he showed up at the next class and, and handed it in saying, oh, I just answered all the problems I saw on the board because uh, I was late for class. And it turns out the instructor had put open questions in mathematics, problems that had not been solved to date. And this student misunderstood that and solved some open problems in mathematics and eventually won the field's medal. So there's, um, you know, there's all sorts of examples of, of, uh, of that uh, kind of loose, informal, unstructured um, work that happens in classes. We try to um, package things up so they're not as unstructured with this, uh, uh, this method of education. But occasionally when we first roll out a course, it takes us uh, a semester or two to get all of those uh, bugs worked out. Okay. Um, what is the difference between the MCS and an MS degree? And will the MCS qualify someone for a PhD or to pursue a PhD later should they choose to? Sure. So um, let me start by saying uh, you, you can get into our PhD program with just a bachelor's degree. You do not need a master's degree. What you do need to do to get into the PhD program is have demonstrated research, um, either as an undergraduate student through a research experience for undergraduates or working as an undergraduate student on research papers um, or, or other mechanisms. Um, students will often take a master's of science degree um, a master's of science degree is all the coursework of the MCS plus an additional master's thesis that you have to write 
and um, uh, work with a, an advisor uh, um, to basically um, advance the state of the art in computer science in, in some, some fashion. Um, because of that uh, careful interaction, we admit far fewer MS students than we, than we do MCS students. The MCS is really uh, geared towards professional preparation. If you're going to be a practitioner, a developer, a user of computer science, um, you need to uh, understand the state of the art of computer science. We will bring you up to the bleeding edge of computer, of computer sciences uh, and data sciences uh, with the MCS degree but we're not going to um, expect you to write a, a thesis that advances the state of the art in, in any of those areas. Um, and so that's the difference between the MCS degree and the MS degree. Okay, mm, let's see. Oh, here's a question. Um, let's see, is, is there going, or will more courses come online or will there be more uh, room for electives in the future? Uh, absolutely. We've got, uh, I think, 10 new courses coming online or uh, some, some large number of courses that will be available this year. We've got courses in parallel programming, software engineering, programming languages, um, and scientific computing. Those are all uh, available this, uh, uh, this fall or this spring. Um, uh, I'm working on a new course in computer graphics. Uh, we've got courses coming online on compilers, uh, compiler construction, on uh, Internet of Things is, is, is in, in the works. So we've got quite a few courses in development in addition to the courses that we have now. Um, the, the MCS uh, degree requires uh, four areas of breadth, meaning you have to take four courses uh, in four different areas of computer science. If you're focusing on data sciences, then those are in cloud computing, data mining, data visualization, and machine learning. But there's other areas that you can focus on too, including software engineering, programming languages, and so on, uh, scientific computing, uh, and, and uh, human-computer interaction, and, and a few others. And we have courses available in those areas. But you'll need to take four of those breadth areas, plus three 500-level classes, and that's seven classes total and so that leaves as electives one one final course that you can take often um, uh, you can you can uh, one of those 500 level classes will be a capstone classes class which requires two data mining classes or two cloud computing classes or two machine learning classes to take and so um, often that eighth class will be that additional class needed to qualify for the capstone okay so that brings us to 12.59 Mountain Time, 11.59 Central Time, and whatever else times we have. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that um, brings us to the conclusion of the webinar. Uh, there are a lot of questions. We apologize we couldn't get to every single one of your questions. If you would like to drop your question um, via email to us, I'm putting the email in the chat box. Um, if you have additional questions we didn't get to, um, please send it to mcs at cs.illinois.edu and we will address it there. Um, we will address questions um, for general, general online MCS or MCSDS since it is the same degree. Um, and we'll try to get to your questions there. Thank you, uh, John and Vivica. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Again, this session is recorded um, and you'll get a link of the recording. Okay. okay, thanks everybody. Thank thanks, you. thanks everybody. Have a good day, evening, night. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.